Hello and welcome to today's lecture. Today we will look deeper into the structure of varieties and examine their regularity using the concept of smoothness, which is an important concept from geometry. You will recognize many of the constructions from earlier courses you have taken, even courses in calculus. The intuition behind smoothness is that we want to call, say, a curve to start with smooth at a given point if it has a well-defined tangent line at that point, a well-defined linearization. So if you're coming from a geometric background, you might think of infinite differentiability when it comes to smoothness, but here we're only taking the derivative one time, so to speak. So uh, for example, this curve at this point is smooth because we have a well-defined tangent line. These are pictures for the intuition. But for this curve at this point, it's not clear how to draw a line tangent to the curve. So we would expect this curve not to be smooth at that point. Similarly, if we have a self-intersection, then at the intersection point, or for that matter, if we have the coordinate cross again at the intersection point, it is unclear where to draw the tangent line. And one thing that seems to come to mind is that the ambiguity is not that we are unable to draw a tangent line, but that we have too much choice somehow. Keep that in mind for later. Of course, this can be generalized to higher dimension, but there the idea is the same. Smoothness should amount to being able to approximate your variety surface object um, by something planar, something linear at that, uh, at a given point. And if uh, you uh, remember from calculus, if you have some sort of surface like that, then the tangent plane is defined by being perpendicular, orthogonal, to the gradient uh, of the function giving you the surface implicitly. And this is something that we will use. In particular, we'll have to deal with derivatives somehow. We want the tangent space to be the zero set of some linear equations whose coefficients are uh, these entries of this uh, gradient, so these partial derivatives with respect to the various coordinates. But we are in an algebraic setting, so we cannot define derivatives using limits. However, the formal derivatives or the derivatives of polynomial functions can always be defined over any field. Namely, as you have always done, by saying that the derivative of ti to the power d with respect to ti is obtained by pulling down the coefficient, the exponent and reducing the exponent by 1. And you do this linearly over uh, the other variables. So this means that this notation means that ti is not included. So in particular, say if I want to take the derivative of, say here, t2 of t1, t2 plus t2 to the power 3. This will be t1 plus 3 t2 squared, as you would expect. Then we can define the tangent space of an affine variety. So we're now requiring that we have an affine variety that is embedded in an explicit way into affine space over the field K that we always assume is algebraically closed, even though for this definition, this is not yet important. And so the tangent space at a given point A, um, and this uh, is the set of all points in the ambient space satisfying this system of linear equations. So for each function f in the vanishing ideal of x, the sum whose terms are the partial derivatives with respect to ti at a times xi minus ai is equal to zero. 
This is exactly in uh, your Euclidean intuitive picture, the scalar product between the gradient and the uh, sort of distance vector to the point x from the point a. And we require this for all functions in the vanishing ideal. A few remarks, and perhaps you should pause and draw a picture and think about this definition. So uh, ta of x, the tangent space, is a vector subspace of a n with origin a. So what does this mean? We have so far viewed a n as a set, not as a vector space. But of course it has the same points as uh, the vector space k n. So what I here really mean is that this is k n, but so the addition um, and scaling is, is as usual, but the origin I put at my point A. Why is it a vector subspace? Well, it is the, so the set of solutions to a system of linear equations that uh, becomes homogeneous once you have centered the vector space at A, so to speak. This might look worrying because I have potentially infinitely many things here, but in a minute you will see that this is not necessary, in fact. So one simplification we can make is that we can always translate our variety x so that our point A ends up at the actual origin of A n, so, so at the point with coordinates 0, etc. 0. And, uh, this simplifies this system of equations. So here we have xi instead of xi minus ai. But also we can view this in a different and easier way. Namely, the tangent space is the vanishing set of f1 for all f in the vanishing ideal. Remember f1, this is the homogeneous part of degree 1. So this is the degree 1 part of uh, f. And by degree, I mean total uh, degree. And so let's take an example. If f of t1, t2 is 1 plus t1 minus t2 plus t1, t2, say, then the degree 1 part is this part. And why is this the same as that? Well, when I take these partial derivatives, everything that is of degree zero will disappear, so it will not um, contribute. And everything of higher degree, after taking the derivative once, will still have some ti in it, and ti, of course, vanishes at zero. So, so the derivative of this, say, with respect to t2 is t1, which at zero is zero. And so therefore, this is the same thing. What's more, you don't have to check all functions in the vanishing ideal. It's enough to check the functions in a set generating i of x. This is because the vanishing set of these f1 is stable under uh, addition and multiplication by arbitrary functions. So maybe pause and try this yourself. So the set to the left here is clearly included to in the set to the right, because here at the right you require fewer things to vanish. To prove the inverse inclusion, you have to see that if you have a function, functions f and g in um, i of x such that f1 of x is 0 and g1 of x is 0, then f plus g1 of x is 0. But this is clear because the one part of f plus g is the sum of the one part of f and the one part of g. 
And what's more, if you take any arbitrary h in i x and look at h times f 1 at x, well, when you take a product of two polynomials, the linear part will be the constant part of h times the linear part of f plus the constant part of f times the linear part of h. And the reason this is zero is because by assumption the linear part of f at x is zero. Also by assumption we're assuming that the point zero is uh, included in this variety so since f uh, vanishes on x it vanishes there so this will be zero and this is why it holds. So in other words this is a system of finitely many uh, equations. Let's look at a few examples. First let's look at the case where our x is the vanishing set of x2 minus x1 squared. So this is this function. And I take my a at the origin and then t a of x is the vanishing set. And now I will directly look at the degree one terms. If you wish, you can check the derivative definition on this. But the degree one term here is x squared. So uh, v of x, uh, sorry, x2, not x squared, and v of x2 is this x1 axis, as expected. So this seems reasonable. Let us next look at the following. Take x to be the vanishing set of x2 squared minus x1 squared minus x1 cubed. This is something of this shape. And uh, the tangent space at a, where I'm taking again a to be my origin, is simply v of 0 because I have no linear terms here and this is all of a2 so everything is the tangent space here and intuitively there are two things to take home from this first of all this happens because I have at least two candidates where to draw the tangent line at a and so the smallest uh, subspace spanned by these two the subspace spanned by these two is is the whole um, space a2. The second remark is, well, taking my point a to be the origin, I am getting rid of the constant terms here. So the degree one term is the lowest degree term of this polynomial. And the fact that this polynomial doesn't have a non-zero degree one term means that there are things that are beyond capturing linearly and this is somehow why I get problems when I try to linearly approximate this thing. Let's look at a third and final example with x being the vanishing set of x2 squared minus x1 cubed. So this is the thing that looks like this. It has a cusp at zero. And here again, by the same reasoning, I get so ta of x, the vanishing set of zero, which is all of a2. And here it's not so clear why it should be this. It is clear that there is some sort of ambiguity if I were to try to approximate this curve by a line at this point A. So this is what calculations of tangent spaces might look like. So this was in the case where we had an affine variety already embedded 